Okay, so hi, my name is Amanda. Um, and I'm actually going to talk about some work that I did mostly in a biology lab, actually. And so my project basically revolves around this fun little device that I built out of two cameras, a tripod, this metal rod that we had, and this cool <laughs> circuit board that I got off of Amazon.com for 30 bucks. And so I'm just going to kind of explain um, sort of the motivation behind what we did and what we were trying to accomplish. So I work in a biomechanics lab. And we study um, animal flight, so mostly like birds and insects. And so one of the techniques that we use a lot is called stereo videography. And what this is, is basically when you film the same scene with multiple cameras, so two or more, and then you can put together visual information from those cameras to get the 3D position of pretty much every object in the scene. And so this is sort of the same idea that your brain is using when it puts together information from both your eyes to like, you know, get depth and stuff like that. So in this example, we're filming a, um, some sort of swallow, a bird, in other words. And um, you can see that in, we have two cameras filming, and in each one, we've marked the 2D coordinate of the bird over in multiple frames. And then we can use this cool technique called math to put them together and figure out the bird's flight path in 3D. So we can get some pretty cool data with this. So for example, here is a chimney swift flock, and you can see we have the 3D positions of the bird at each point in the frame. So, okay. okay, so one of the problems with this, or not really problems, but like just restrictions, is that the cameras have to be calibrated with each other first. So, you know, we have to go out there, we have to set up the cameras, and we have to wave something like a meter stick, like a known object, through the frame. And then later we can figure out exactly where the cameras are relative to each other. And if the camera, and that, we need to calibrate the cameras, obviously, to be able to get accurate 3D points from them. So this means, basically, the important part about this is that it means that we can't move the cameras relative to each other at all while filming. Otherwise, our calibration will be off, and any points we get out of it will be meaningless. So we basically, our workflow, we go out to the field, we're like, oh, there's some birds. We set up the cameras, um, we take our calibration footage, then we film the birds, and we can't touch the cameras after we originally set them up, so we can't move them. So that works great for birds, but I wanted to film dragonflies. And so just so that we're like all on the same page with the biological terminology here, so dragonflies are bugs, they are fast bugs, and they are also in general smaller than birds. And this is important because it means they're hard to film. So I mean it's basically like trying to film a crayon with wings that's like flying past you at eight meters per second, so it's hard. So because they don't really show up. So if you're close enough that you can actually see them on the camera, they're just going to shoot out of the frame. And if you're far enough back that you can see the whole flight path, um, you know, they're going to be like less than a pixel and you can't see them at all in the video. So we were like, okay, we need a new technique for this. So we need to basically be able to move the camera. So we need to go up, get close enough that we can actually see them. And then we need to be able to like move the cameras to follow their path. Okay, we can't move the cameras relative to each other, so that's fine. We'll just fix them relative to each other. So attach them to this aluminum rod, put the aluminum rod on this tripod. Now we can rotate, and the tripod has this like little um, ball joint down here that we can rotate. And so we can rotate around that, and that allows us the dragonfly flies past, and we're just like, oh, and we just follow it um, along the shore of the lake pretty much, and it gives us a way wider field of view. Okay, but the problem with that is that if we're going to be rotating the cameras, we have to know what rotation we did, essentially, because, you know, if the frame is moving and the dragonfly is moving, if we want to figure out, you know, we're going to have the dragonfly's flight path in relation to the cameras, but the camera is a moving observer, so we need to get it in relation to a stationary observer. So we can do this if we know the orientation, so basically the rotation from the reference frame of the camera rig at every single point in the video for every frame. Okay, so how are, in the heck are we going to get that? So we use this cool little thing called an IMU. It's just this little tiny chip, and it has um, accelerometers, magnetometers, and gyroscopes that um, measure along three axes each. And so we can put this all together and get the actual orientation of our rig. So we can do this by, so first of all, the magnetometer is going to tell us what direction we're facing, because it can just function as a compass tell us where north is, and then so if we know we're facing this way, our IMU is facing this way, we know north is that way, then we know exactly how much we've rotated um, away from our reference frame. Okay, so the accelerometers, when they're sitting still or when they're not accelerating, are only going to measure acceleration due to gravity. So that means when the accelerometers are not moving, 
the acceleration vector just points straight up, exactly opposite gravity. So this gives us another point of reference, sort of. So we can do some fun trig, and based on knowing gravity, we can figure out essentially our tilt, so how far up and like how far tilted. And so with the magnetometer and the accelerometers, we can figure out our orientation. And so we would be done, except for obviously the accelerometers are not always measuring just gravity. So if the accelerometers are moving, because we're you know, waving the ring about or whatever, um, they're going to be measuring that acceleration as well. So places like here, so this is showing um, rotation around the y-axis that we're measuring. The red line shows what it should be, and the blue line is just from the accelerometers. And you can see that when we kind of jerk it, when there's a high acceleration, it kind of gets overwhelmed and we no longer know where up is, and it's hard to figure out where the red line should be just based on the blue line. Okay. So, but, so we need another method. So we have the gyroscopes, and those are going to measure angular velocity. And so, you know, if you remember from calculus, if we have velocity, we can integrate to find position. So theoretically, that works. The problem is that the gyros, you can see, do this fun phenomenon where they drift to infinity, because basically they're noisy enough that when you integrate, the noise starts to build up, and it thinks it's moving when it's not. So. So we got to put it all together. So the red line shows what we want. What we have is the blue line from the accelerometers and the magnetometer. And from the orange line, we have the gyros. And we got to figure out how to get the red line. In places like here, where we're not really moving, we want to use the accelerometers mostly, because they're going to be at the actual correct position. But when we're moving a lot, we're going to have to pay attention to the gyros, because they're going to help us smooth out and figure out what actually happened here. OK. So we're going to use a Kalman filter which I'm not really going to go into a lot, but basically we um, get an estimate of orientation from the accelerometer to my powder, get another estimate from the gyros, we figure out the difference between them, and then we decide how much we're going to trust each. So how much we're going to trust the gyroscopes, how much we're going to trust the, or the, the accelerometers. So, okay. So we're basically, basically what it comes down to is this Kalman gain, so this um, K, which we're going to, this value, and we're going to recalculate it at every time step and decide at that time step how much do we trust the gyros, how much do we trust the accelerometers, and which estimate are we going to pay most attention to. So we kind of had to come up with a way to sort of heuristically calculate this thing based on the noise in the system and also based on how much motion there was hap that, that was happening at that point in time. So basically what this comes down to is we did some math and we got the orientation of the camera rig in every frame. So now we have that, um, and we know we can get the 3D point in the camera rig's point of view. We can then transform it, because we know the orientation of the camera rig, into a global reference frame. So that's sweet. So we do this with more math. And then, so this is just showing some sample results. So this is me. I was filming a stationary point and just waving the cameras around. So the black line shows where the cameras sort of are seeing this point at. So it looks like it moved a ton, but it's really the cameras are moving. The point is sitting still, but the cameras are moving, so they think the point moved. Green shows where the point actually was when we did the back transformation and tried to get it in world coordinates. So you know, if this worked perfectly, then the green dots would all be in exactly one spot. You can see there's, they're kind of in this fun little cloud, but it was a small enough error that for dragonflies, it was fine, because the dragonflies are moving at eight meters a second. So it doesn't matter if like, we have like two centimeters per second of error. OK. Same deal, um, exact same data, just in a different form. The green line should be flat. They're sort of wiggly, but I still feel good about it. Um, and so here's some sample data for a dragonfly. The black is in the camera's point of view, so it's sort of compressed because we're moving to follow it. The green is in global coordinates, so you can see we got to cover a wider area than we would have otherwise. Okay, and that's it. So thanks to everyone who helped me, and I got funding from UNC Office of Undergraduate Research. Okay, cool. I remember when that was awesome.